Good morning, UCC. Uh, this morning we gather in our homes and I'm here bringing you the message for this morning. I know we are all uh, worried about this virus, coronavirus, and what it's doing to our uh, people, to the society, to the world at large. But we have hope in God that he will take care of us and he will take care of our world. As we turn to Exodus this morning, I'm reminded that it is God who sets us free from everything that holds us captive. And we can turn to him this morning. So before we jump into our text for this morning, let us start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for people who are affected by this virus worldwide, that you will bring healing to them. We pray over uh, people who have lost their lives and their families, that they will find comfort in you. Lord, we pray over the nations of this world that you will help us come up with a solution to this problem. Uh, give doctors wisdom as to how to treat patients and in the midst of all the chaos, help us to uh, hold on to each other as well as to you because our hope comes from you. And now, Lord, we pray that you will bless uh, this morning the as we study your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as you know, we are going through the sermon series called Immerse. Uh, we are in the process of going through the first five books of uh, the Bible called the Pentateuch. Today we are going to finish up the book of Exodus by looking at chapters 35 to 40. This is what we have seen so far in Exodus. Uh, God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and is taking them uh, to the land that he promised to give uh, to the descendants of Abraham. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, a prosperous land. But he takes them to the wilderness and this wilderness becomes a place of becoming a place of transformation for his people. This group of ex-slaves coming out of Egypt, they had their many baggages that way they were carrying. And in order to transform them into their new identity as God's people, he took them into the, uh, through the wilderness so they learned to trust him. Uh, God calls uh, this group of people uh, his treasured possession. He calls Israel his treasured possession out of all the nations of the world. Uh, it was not that God did not care about other nations, but it uh, really relates to the vocation of Israel. Israel is supposed to be, according to Exodus, a nation of priests, a holy nation. So Israel was, uh, was supposed to uh, be a witness to the world, uh, to be a light to the world for God. And in that sense, uh, God calls Israel to be his treasured possession, his very own possession that he's going to use to witness to the world. And we see that all throughout the Bible, this call on Israel to be a light. So God enters into a covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai. He gives them the law and his commandments in order to teach them what it means to live in relationship with this God, in order to teach them what it means to be God's treasured possession and to be a witness to the world. They were to be distinct. They were to be a holy nation. And that word holy means set apart. Their behaviors are supposed to be di were supposed to be different from the behaviors of the rest of the world. They were uh, supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. They were supposed to be a holy nation. And so God gave them a set of laws to follow, to obey in order to transform their identity. Then in verses 25 to 40, we read that God gives them this elaborate instructions about how to construct a royal tent where God himself is going to live among his people. 
In chapters 25 to 31, God gives Moses instruction about how to build this tent. But then in chapter 32, we uh, read about uh, Israel rebelling against God. Uh, Moses was gone for a very long time. He was up on the mountain getting instructions from God. And without leadership, Israel decided to build a golden, uh, uh, golden calf and worship that calf. They got drunk and it was a, a wild party. And God was very upset with Israel. However, after Moses came down and he saw that the Israelites were running around wild, he broke uh, the two tablets. It symbolized the breaking of the covenant. And you would think the whole story is over. It's all done. And uh, God is upset and the covenant is broken. But as we see, God, uh, his very nature is to forgive. He's a gracious God. In fact, in chapter 35 uh, or 34, this is how God describes himself to Moses. When he appears to Moses, God says, the Lord, the Lord. This is verse 6, chapter 34. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And out of that love and faithfulness, we see that God allows Moses uh, to chisel out two stone tablets, implying that, the, that he's reinstating the covenant. And as a result, the plan to construct the tent where God would live uh, moves forward. So here we are, and we see in chapters 35 to 40, this description of the construction of the tabernacle, the tent where God is going to live, and all the things that God needed in order for him to come and dwell among his people. Now the question is, how do we read these chapters? These are not easy chapters to go through. You see, people could read chapters 35 to 40 in three different ways. Someone like me would be bored out of uh, his or her mind by all the details of the construction process, the measurement. It is the same response I have when I'm attending a budget or a business meeting. On the other hand, someone who watches, you know, you have heard of uh, Chip and Joanna uh, Gaines uh, uh, from the show Fixer Upper. Someone who is really into construction of turning old buildings into new could really get excited by reading these chapters and could run to Lowe's or Home Goods for their next project. And, they, and could claim that it is divinely inspired. But I believe there's a third way to read these chapters. Just imagine someone who is paying a construction company to build a house. She decides to go and see how the construction is taking place. When she gets there, she sees a bunch of uh, uh, woods and uh, a pile of sand and cement and rods sticking out here and rods and another rod sticking out there. But in the midst of all that, she catches a vision of beauty, of someday her family living there, celebrating many birthdays and holidays, and its halls echoing with the laughter of children. I believe this is the way to approach uh, these chapters 35 to 40. In the midst of all the details that might bore us, we need to catch a glimpse of the beauty that it holds. That these chapters are telling us by describing this construction process, the fact that God of the universe has chosen to come and dwell among his people and wants to relate to them. That's the beauty that we capture. And that's the first lesson that we need to take away from these chapters. God always wants to be with his people. That's an astounding fact. That this God, unlike 
described by some as a distant clock maker who set this world ticking and just took off and is not bothered with it. That's not the God we see in the Bible. This God is deeply involved in his people's lives and he wants to come and dwell on earth with his people. In Exodus 25, we read that God gives instructions uh, to Moses to build a table of wood overlaid with uh, gold and put bread on it. What that implies is that this God invites people to the table and pursues relationship with them. He instructed Moses that when he is building a tabernacle, that he needs to build a table of acacia wood, overlay it with uh, gold, so that the priest could put 12 bread on it, each bread symbolizing a tribe of Israel, because he wants to have fellowship with his people. It's like someone who is in the process of constructing his or her house and things about the future that one day uh, they will have children and things uh, about how they're going to relate to their children. They need a play room or a yard where the children could run around. The person who does that is deeply personal, who wants to engage with his or her children in a deep uh, in a deep personal way. And that is how God, when you look at all the furnishings and everything that God includes, it all includes a personal touch. For example, God says in Exodus uh, chapter 39 to build the altar of incense. What does that mean? That means that God is interested in communicating with his people. He's interested in hearing what his people has to say. The altar of incense is an altar from which the prayers of the people go up. As the smoke of the incense rises to the sky, it's a symbol of prayer going up. And God said, build an altar of incense because this God wants to hear from his people. This God wants to engage with his people. This God invites people to the table to come and fellowship and to eat with him. And this is the God who came down and wants to live in a tent with his people and among his people. This is the beautiful reality that this, these chapters in Exodus depict. That God is not some faraway God, but a personal God who wants to come live with his people. And not only just live with his people. He wants to walk with his people through times of difficulty. All throughout the wilderness. See, when God brought Israel out of slavery, he didn't tell Israel, here's the uh, address to the promised land. When you get there, I'll meet you there. He didn't say that. He says, build me a tent, a portable tent. I will live among you and I will lead you there. Meaning I will go with you. I'm not some kind of a leader who gives you a job description and goes off. I'm the leader who leads you, goes before you. And all throughout the wilderness journey, God is described as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He's a pillar of cloud for his people during the daytime when scorching heat in the middle of the wilderness, beating down. When the sun is beating down on God's people, he forms the pillar of a cloud to give them shade. At night, 
When the night chill comes, when it's cold, when it's dark, he becomes the pillar of fire to show them the way and to warm them. This is the God who wants to live with his people because he wants to lead his people through ups and downs of life. He does not want to leave them alone. And this God is also a protective God. He protects his people. This idea of God coming to leave, live with his people is not something new. It's not just in Exodus. From the very beginning, this has been the desire of God. If you look at the Genesis story, you see in the Garden of Eden, this God dwelt among people. He created Adam and Eve and he went to walks with them. In fact, it is so fascinating that some scholars think that the Garden of Eden was itself a sanctuary, a temple place. In fact, they say that the Garden of Eden foreshadowed the tabernacle. And it's quite interesting the similarities that you see between these two places, the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle. For example, in the Garden of Eden, you hear about cherubim. Uh, these are the winged angelic being guarding the garden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. In the tabernacle also, you hear about two cherubim who are made out of gold to hover over the ark. They were also stitched into the curtains and veil of the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, the many branch lampstand shaped as a tree symbolized the tree of life found in the garden because light is often associated with life. Stones found in the garden of Eden both gold and onyx are also mentioned in the tabernacle. So what this tells us is the Garden of Eden was itself a temple, a dwelling place of God, which foreshadows the coming of the tabernacle and the temple itself. Because from the very beginning, God wanted to dwell with his people. And you know what's amazing? That in the New Testament... The same God comes back as Jesus. And in Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. The word dwelling is a is a translation from the Greek word that could also be translated as tabernacling or tabernacle. So we could read this verse as saying the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, meaning pitched a tent among us. What John is telling us that this is the same God of Exodus who pitched a tent among his people and now he in the person of Jesus has appeared to us. He has taken on the human form, the tent of a human flesh to come and live among his people. After Jesus left, after his resurrection, God didn't cease to be among his people. You read in the New Testament that God's spirit came and lived among his people uh, called the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes to the church, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? What Paul is saying, that God is living among his people still through the Holy Spirit, that God never left. He is with his people dwelling among his people. And one day, this is another amazing fact, that one day at the end of time, God will once again come, and this time forever, and will live with his people. In Revelation 22, verses 3 to 4, we read, it says, No longer will there be any curse. What John is saying, that there will be no more 
or distractions on this earth. No more coronavirus or this virus or that virus or earthquake or violence. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. That's the glorious ending to a glorious story that started with God dwelling on this earth with his people, Adam and Eve. And God's dwelling was disrupted by sin. But God came back and dwelt again among his people in the tabernacle, in the wilderness. And then he came back as Jesus and lived among his people in human flesh. And then he came back as Holy Spirit to live among the people of his church. And at the end of the story in the Bible, we read that God is back again. That he's back on earth and this time for good. And there's no destruction, no crying in pain. His people will see him and he will be with his people. This is the beautiful story of the Bible. This is what the chapters of Exodus 35 to 40 telling us that we have a God who truly cares for us. This God is a protective of us. He wants to take care of our needs, walk with us through ups and downs of life and never leave us alone. The biggest difference between the temple at the beginning of uh, the Bible in Genesis, when God dwelled on this earth with people, was there was no sin, but tabernacle in Exodus is in the context of human sinfulness. So God uh, provided a way for his people to come into a relationship with them, to remain in a relationship with him. He provided an altar of sacrifice, which was before the tabernacle in the outer court, before people could come uh, in the presence of God, they had to offer sacrifice. And through that sacrifice, sinful people could be atoned of their sinfulness, could be cleansed, and could enter into a relationship with God. In the New Testament, Jesus is that sacrifice. We are entering Easter season. And we'll be hearing uh, the famous verses that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What that verse is telling us that Jesus is the atonement for our sins and we can approach God freely through him. That we can be in relationship with God. With a God who wants to live with us, who wants to hear our prayers, who wants to walk with us through ups and downs of life. That is the good news. And that good news did not just appear in the New Testament. It started all the way back in the Old Testament as we look at these chapters of Exodus 35 to 40. So what are some of the practical applications that we could take from these chapters, Exodus 35 to 40? First, I want to say that the material space uh, matters. As growing up as a child, I used to listen to this song. It was a Christian hymn in India. Uh, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through by treasures laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And it's a pretty song, uh, but it has a bad theology. Uh, we are not just passing through. And yes, this world is our home. And we need to invest in it. Because all throughout the Bible, you see... God is coming to dwell among his people on this earth. What does that mean? That means that the material space matters. That we need to take care of the world. That even though the church are made out of people, where the spirit of God uh, dwells among people, the church also is located in a particular physical space 
and taking care of that space is our responsibility. So people who clean the church, the janitors, people who maintain the roof are doing the good work of the Lord by taking care of the physical space because physical space matters. It is in the physical space that God promised to dwell among his people. He said, build a tabernacle, build curtains, tables, lampstand, all physical items. Because God created this physical space where one day he would come and dwell among his people. It's not a political thing whether we should take care of this world or not. But it is core. It is at the core of who we are as God's people. You see, in Genesis 2, verse 15, when God created Adam, he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. That's our responsibility because the physical space matters. Secondly, people matter. God did not just come and occupy our physical space. He occupied us physical space so that he could live with his people. That's the second application. Relationship matters. God enters into relationship with his people. He wants to hear his people pray. The altar of incense. He lays out a table, bread, and welcomes his people to come and fellowship with them. So if you're sitting in a physical space with a bunch of people whom you love, you're celebrating what is at the core of God's heart. Community. God's people. Celebrating life together with God at the center. What I want you to take away from this message this morning, that this world, our relationship, and everything matters. Because that's what God did when he came and became a, a resident of this earth, when he came to live among his people. He celebrated his relationship with us. He celebrated the material creation. So this Sunday, even though you're struggling with the fear about this coronavirus and this and that, take time to enjoy God's world and enjoy each other, the relationship that God has given you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that we are wonderfully and beautifully made in your image that you created this beautiful world and you created beautiful people to enjoy each other and mostly to enjoy you, to worship you. And we worship you this morning, Father God. Wherever we are, we give you thanks. And we take time to recognize in our relationship the gift, the beautiful gift that you have given us. Lord, bless us this morning and this week to come. May we take time to uh, breathe in the air that uh, surrounds us. May we take time to look at the spring flowers, hear the birds and the bees, and just sing our heart out to you. What a beautiful world. And one day in this world, Father God, we look forward to having you here with us and enjoying our life with you forever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.